First Chronicles chapter 12, and we might start at verse 22 just to give us context this morning. So let me just explain where we're breaking into this story in First Chronicles 12. Uh, King Saul is dead, and now David has come on the scene. David is about to be king of all Israel. And in this story we're looking at, we're not going to read it all because there's a lot of information here. Basically, all the different warriors, all the different soldiers are coming to support David. And they're all saying, hey, we're behind you. We're going to fight with you. Um, so verse 22 says this, For at that time, day by day, there came to David to help him until it was a great host, like the host of God. And these are the numbers of the bands that were ready armed to the war and came to David to Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. We'll go to verse 32. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were two hundred and all their brethren were at their commandment. I've called this message this morning, we need to have an understanding of the times. We need to have an understanding of the times. In First Chronicles chapter 12, we find a list of all the great soldiers and regiments that David had fighting for him. They all brought their qualities to the table. Um, David was about to be crowned king over all Israel. And this was a very pivotal moment in Israel's history. It's here that the children of Issachar stepped forward. And it says that they had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Basically, they knew what was happening in Israel, what needed to be done and how to do it. Oh, that we would have people like that in our days. Amen? Amen. People that knew they were, they had understanding of the times and they know and they knew what had to happen. We live in a day where many think they understand the day they live in, but they do not. In fact, there's many others that just don't care. They just like, they seem to get caught uh, in a, just in the flow of things and they miss or they, they're just oblivious to the day that they're living in. But there's many others think that they know what is coming, but they don't. Only God knows what's approaching. Amen? Amen? We can guess. We can speculate. We can even guess what's going to happen in the Ukraine. You talk to people, everybody's got their opinion how it's going to end. Um, but when we connect with God, we're qualified to know his heart and to know his mind. Brother, sister, when you are close to God... When you're sensitive to his voice, when you're aware of what is going on around you, then you should not be ignorant of the times you're living in and what is actually expected of you. Um, as in every generation, to have a true understanding of the times, you're going to have to see things from God's heavenly perspective. We have a habit of always looking at things from our little puny earthly perspective we think that we know everything that's happening but brother sister we don't if you are looking at things from man's earthly carnal perspective then you are not truly going to know what's going on around you we need to remind ourselves it does not matter if things are humanly dark depraved or depressing god is still alive god is still working and god is still in control let me say that once more. It does not matter if things are humanly dark, depraved, or depressing. God is still alive, God is still working, and God is still in control. Amen? Amen. I'm convinced that God wants to reveal his heart to us more than we want to receive it. So, if we are silent enough to listen, if we are patient enough to wait, if we're godly enough to submit to his promptings and willing enough to receive, I believe that God will reveal himself to you and me. Can I say that again once more? 
if we are silent enough to listen, if we are patient enough to wait, if we are godly enough to submit to his promptings and willing enough to receive, I believe that God will reveal himself to us. The bottom line is we're so busy today. There's just so many voices today that honestly, there's so much going on in our head and our heart that we kind of don't know, they say in Ireland, we don't know whether we're punch board or countersunk. <laughs> Anybody know what that is? Was that ever used over here, Bill? What's punch board or countersunk? They're all carpentry terms. Okay? So we say that there's just so much going on, we kind of don't know where we are or what we're doing or where we're going. Because we live in a small world today, we've seen, uh, we had a talk here about a globe this morning, about the earth. But we live in a small world today, would you agree? If something happens at the other end of the world, we can hear about it within seconds. Because we live in a small world, because information is so accessible today, because we live in a fallen world full of wickedness, it is easy to get focused on everything the devil is doing on this earth. Would you agree? It's easy. Talk to many Christians today and you will quickly discover that they have a big devil and a small God. All they see is the problem. All they want to talk about is the problem. The question we need to ask is this. Regardless of how dark it is, what should the believer be looking for and looking at in these days? What should we be looking for? What should the watchman be looking for? Well, I've got six answers. And if you're writing notes this morning, I would encourage you to write these six things down. What should we be looking for? First thing is, where is God? Number two, what is he doing? Number three, what is he saying? Number four, what is he looking from me? Number five, what is he looking from the church? Number six, finally, what is the enemy doing? The sad thing today is many Christians have only one string to their guitar. They're only interested in what is the devil doing? I mean, can you... Imagine going to listen to somebody singing and they've got one string to their guitar. How do you think that would sound? Huh? That's the way it is today. Many think that, that what, that's what it means to understand the times. But it is only a very small part of the overall picture and probably the least important issue of all the issues. Did you hear me? Now, I didn't say that it wasn't important to know what the enemy's doing. I said that it is the least important issue of the six things that I mentioned. Remember, Jesus was never a reactionary. He was proactive in his ministry. The devil was always chasing Jesus in a desperate attempt to stop him fulfilling his ministry. Now, the early church after Pentecost was not reactionary. Would you agree? It was proactive in its ministry. The devil was always chasing the early church after Pentecost in a desperate attempt to stop it fulfilling the will of God. I could give multiple scriptures to support both, but I don't want to get sidetracked this morning. I was watching the news a couple of days ago and they were interviewing a Ukrainian soldier on the front line. Literally, as he's been interviewed, the bullets are whizzing past him. And they're interviewing him and this is what he said. He's pointing out at the, the enemy lines. They're talking about it. They were like... Uh, like less than a mile within their distance. They could actually nearly see them shooting at them. And this is what he said. They, the Russian soldiers, have a lot of people. They have a lot of tanks. They have a lot of technology. But it doesn't matter how they fight. If we fight like lions, they won't win. 
Isn't that powerful? And I'm like, you're right. The reason why Putin will not win in Ukraine is because he's fighting a nation of people that are fighting for their livelihood, for their own territory, for their land. You'll never defeat that because you're going to have to kill 40 million people. There's women running about with anti-tank weapons. There's 16-year-old boys running about with anti-tank weapons. You can't stop that. I have fought in a, in a terrorist war. If they fight like guerrillas, you can't defeat that. Because they can just rest for a few days and go quiet. People drop their guard. <clears throat> this reminds me of a documentary that I watched a few years ago that grabbed me. It was on the mafia. How the mafia was broken in America. There was a time where the mafia had... People in fear, not just in New York, but throughout America. People were scared of the mafia. Well, they were interviewing one of the guys who was a cop who actually infiltrated the mafia. And he was one of the main men in bringing down the mafia. He infiltrated them and he was part of bringing them to their knees. And, of course, everybody knows the mafia was a ruthless, ruthless group. Um, and if you were disloyal to the mafia, you were wasted. You were gone. So he was asked by the, by the reporter, were you not scared? Were you not scared knowing how the mafia, if you were outed in any way, how the mafia was going to deal with you, were you not scared? And the guy smiled. He wasn't being arrogant. He just smiled. He said this, my father always taught me when I was in a tough spot to concentrate upon my weaponry and not that of the enemy. He said this, I was al always knew how potent my guns were. Any army that is captivated with the size, the activity and the ability of the enemy is destined for defeat. Fact. That is because they are looking in the wrong direction for their comfort. We are living in a day where everyone seems to be expert on what the devil is doing. But few seem excited or informed about what God is doing. It's ridiculous. How has the church arrived there? I would say a large percentage of the church in America has been taken out of the battle because they're obsessed with the problem. They're obsessed with the problem. It's ridiculous. In warfare, it doesn't make sense. Can I remind you, when God decides to come to the fore, the devil doesn't stand a chance. The wicked do not stand a chance. I don't care whether there's 10 billion devils between us and the will of God. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. That's a fact. And by the way, this book is good news. It's not doom and gloom. People who function there do not have faith. They do not hope. They, they, they're focused on the problem and not on the answer, Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 31 asks a question. If God be for us, who can be against us? What's the answer to that? Sensitivity to God is an attitude of heart. It comes from an overwhelming desire to be close to Him, to please Him. And when you get close to Him, you have hope. <clears throat> Suddenly the devil starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and God becomes bigger and greater and mightier. Amen? Amen. The enemy starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Talk to David when he took on Goliath. Those who weren't getting it were shivering in, in the trenches, just going, oh, look at the size of Goliath. Look how strong he is. Look what he's doing. Look what he's saying. They were so fixated with the problem that they wouldn't even get out of the trenches. When you see God for who he is, I can tell you what, faith arises. 
hope arises. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, the children of Issachar are commended because they were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Now the obvious implication from this verse is, uh, this text is, that it is only when you understand the times that you're living in that you can truly know what God wants to do with you and with the church. Do you know the day that you're living in? Are you fully aware of the day that you're living in? I believe that we in this church, if we have an understanding of the times that we're living in, then we too will know what we ought to do. It would get rid of all apathy. It would get rid of all the distractions to stop us serving God. It would get rid of all the negativity. And we would embrace, embrace the Great Commission. The Great Commission is good news for this generation. Amen? Amen. We have got hope. We have an answer. We have the victory. We are not just waiting for victory. We have the victory today. Hallelujah. All this defeatism, we are not a defeated army. We will never be a defeated army because Jesus is for us. Jesus is fighting for us. Hallelujah. I want to come close to you this morning. <coughs> and I want to ask you a, personal, a few personal questions this morning. In light of the six things that I mentioned. Do you have an understanding of the times you're living in? Do you? Do you have an understanding of the times? Okay, so I want to address these six points that I made in regard uh, earlier in the, in the message. Do you know where God is at at the moment? Do you? Do you know where God is at? In the midst of all the noises, all the darkness, all the news, all the opinions, all the whatever. Do you know where God is at the moment? Next question. Do you know what he's doing at the moment? Next. Do you know what he's saying at the moment? What is God speaking at the moment? What is the voice of God saying at the moment? Do you know what he's looking from you at the moment? Do you know what he's looking from you? Next question, do you know what he's looking from the church in this hour? Finally, do you know what the enemy is doing? Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and the Sadducees back in the day who come to him. They were trying to catch him out. And what did he say to them in Matthew chapter 16 verse 2? Remember, these were religious people who faithfully went to the house of God. They knew the word of God. They tithed 10% of their wage, went to God, and he is cutting them to pieces. This is what he said. When it's evening, you say it will be a fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, Ye can discern the face of the sky. But can ye not discern the signs of the times? Their ignorance was inexcusable. They should have known the day they lived in. This made them culpable before God. Now remember this. The Pharisees could see the problem. But they couldn't see the answer. The answer was before them in the form of Jesus Christ. The truth, the Messiah, the one who was longed for for thousands of years, and yet they couldn't see him moving. By the way, you can be an expert in the Word of God. You can know this book from Genesis to Revelation. And you could still, still end up in hell. You could be a theologian. There's many theologians in hell today. 
Many who knew this book from cover to cover, but they didn't know the author of the book. They couldn't see him. By the way, I'll go, I'll say something else. You can be an expert in past history. You can know everything about the history of America, the history of, of the people of God. You can know all that and still go to hell. You can be an expert on the future, not just the past, but you can know everything about the second coming of the Lord and still end up in hell. Still miss the, what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. In the midst of where you are today, can you see God? Can you see God doing things, saying things, moving? Or are you oblivious to that this morning? According to scripture, it's not just smart to discern the times that we live in. We should be aware of the signs of the times. If you know this book, you will know the signs of the times. What are the signs of the times? The signs of the times are the pointers around us as to where we are in human history, what type of day we're living in, and where we are in regard to the coming of the Lord. Remember this, there's two focal points in history. The first coming of the Lord and the second coming of the Lord. We are somewhere in between. Remember, everything in history is working according to God's overarching sovereign plan to an ultimate climatic and victorious conclusion. Did you hear what I said? Everything in history is working according to God's overarching sovereign plan to an ultimate climatic and victorious conclusion. It's all going to work out. Amen? Amen? If you want to be depressed, if you want to be discouraged, if you want to be a doom and gloom merchant, be that. But that's the opposite to what it is to be a New Testament Christian. We win. We are winning and we win. God's people have been winning for centuries. If we are spiritually sensitive, if we are biblically informed, then we should be able to identify the historic signs in this present age which are drawing us toward the glorious return of Jesus Christ. You should be seeing the signs of the times. Let me give you an illustration. How do we know springtime's coming? You start to hear the little birds chirping, amen? Anybody love springtime here? Huh? Why do you love springtime? New life. Would you agree? The grass starts to change from brown to green. Exactly. Things start to grow. Leaves start to grow on the trees. There's just something uplifting about springtime. But there's signs. You see the little buds in the tree. And it's like, they're signs. <coughs> well, Scripture tells us that there will be signs, just like there's signs that springtime's coming, there's signs that Jesus is coming. By the way, it's not all doom and gloom. There's good signs. It's an exciting thing that we are about to see the Lord Jesus Christ in all his majesty, in all his glory. And he's not coming as a savior the next time. He's coming as judge. He's not coming to be mocked and scoffed. He's not coming to have his beard plucked and his, his face spat upon. Nobody's going to do that. He's coming in majesty, power and glory. He's coming to judge every man, including Putin. He will account for what is happening today in the Ukraine. He will actually have to bow his knee and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. So will Al-Qaeda. So will all those Muslim terrorists out there. They will all have to bow and say that he is Lord. He is God. So will the Mormons and the, and the Jehovah's Witnesses who deny that he's God. 
They deny that he is Lord. When you look at the name Lord Jesus Christ, Lord tells us that he's God. Jesus tells us that he's man. Christ tells us that he's the Messiah. When we worship him as Lord, we're saying that Jesus is God. Amen? Amen. When he was a little baby, do you know what they did? They came to him, they bowed down and worshipped him. If he was not God, then that's idolatry. Someday, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses will have to acknowledge that he is God. He was not just a man. He wasn't a man who became a God like you and me can become a God, apparently. He was God. God Almighty manifested in human flesh. What a day that's going to be. By the way, it's getting close. We should be excited. We should be expecting because it's getting close to the breaking of the day. The trumpet is about to sound. Are you excited? Or are you depressed? Are you focused on the answer? Or are you focused on the problem? For the record, the signs of the times do not just refer to a cluster of events at the end, but they refer to events that lie in the past, in the present, and also in the future. The signs of the times have been happening for 2,000 years. Please acknowledge that. A lot of, honestly, I'll tell you what happens in eschatology circles. You know what eschatology circles are? End time circles. Um, there's a lot of end time experts out there. Let me tell you a couple of the concerns I have about some of the different views. Futurists are so obsessed with the end that they miss what he has been doing for 2,000 years. Historists are so obsessed with the past and especially AD 70 that they miss what he's doing now and what he's, miss doing, he's going to do in the future. If you have a balanced view of eschatology or end times, you will see that the end times were ushered in when Jesus came to this earth in physical form. The end times started 2,000 years ago. And the last day will be when he appears. So we have been in the last days for 2,000 years. But end time eschatology is being unfolded right now because we are in the last days. And it seems like by the signs of the time we are in the last of the last days, it seems like the Lord is coming soon. But it could be another 100 years. Would you agree? We think 100 years is such a long time. Now, let me just give you a little revelation that I've got in this last few years. I used to think 100 was ancient, okay? Until I got to 50. And I, I used to say, okay, I got to 50 and I'm like, wow, this life is quick. It's just like a blink. And then I, I was watching TV one night. I was watching Gold Rush. I know Gary used to like Gold Rush. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was watching Gold Rush and w the old guy there, I keep forgetting his name, the, the old grandpa. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers his name. Um, Parker Schnobel's grandpa. He was like 94 and he was still gold mining. And I'm like, Jen said one night, hey, he's really old, isn't he, for what he's doing? And I'm like, okay, at that time I was 50. Now I'm 56, and like, I'm really going the other way. Um, <laughs> so I'm like, I was like 50, and this guy's like 93 or 94. And I'm like, my life has been just like that, a blink. 100 years? It's just two of them. Two blinks. Then I started to think, like 2,000 years ago, it's just a few blinks. I'm like, this life is quick. Um, so we think 100 years down the road, that is so far away. It's just like, that is so far away. Like Jesus, he'll come before then. 100 years is just two blinks. To Jesus, it's probably not even two blinks. So what I'm saying is he could come today. I believe that he could come today. But he could come in 100 years or longer. But we need to be ready. 
We need to be excited. We need to be expecting that He is in control. He reigns. He rules. And what the wicked do, they can do it. But I tell you what, they're just sending themselves to hell. I am not going to spend the rest of my life focused on what they're doing. I want to focus on what He's doing. What is He doing at the moment? So I trust that those questions that I've asked you, you take them to heart this morning. Jesus actually lamented over these religious people 2,000 years ago. And he said something interesting in Luke chapter 19, verses 42 through 44. Listen to what he said. If you had known even thou, at least in this thy day, your day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest, knewest not the time of thy visitation. The time. They didn't know the signs of the times. Jesus was there. Jesus was moving. Jesus was speaking. But they weren't interested. They were more interested in destroying Jesus. Destroying the disciples. They couldn't get it. They didn't see the move of God. Can you see the move of God today? Sometimes we literally should just take time out and have a service of testimonies. Start row after row where people were 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 5 years ago. And I can tell you what, God has been moving in our midst. God has been changing lives. People come into this church broken, lost, abandoned, hurt, Rejected, and today they're wonderfully, wonderfully saved. And they're not only saved, but they're serving the Lord. They're serving the Lord. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Today, what is He doing in our midst? Christian, you have a very, very small window to put the ball in the net. You have a small window. Jesus said, It's your day. He said, thy day. It says, thy day in the King James. Basically, you didn't know this was your day. This is what you're going to account for today. You don't choose your day. That was already chosen for you. But what you do choose is what you do in your day. There's none of us had a choice in our birth. Would you agree? None of us had a part in our birth, apart from just be born. But we know for sure that we have a choice today. We're either going to be what we're meant to be, or we're going to miss it. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 5, A wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment, because to every purpose there is a time and judgment. Therefore, the misery of man is great upon him. As I come to a close, I want to say this. I believe God lets or permits wicked things to happen around us and even distracting things to happen around us in order for to reveal to us who we are and who others are around us. Would you agree? He's got a plan. Everything around us is happening for a reason. Um... He lets you go through personal battles for a reason. He lets us, the people of God, go through collective battles for a reason. He lets you go through natural battles and spiritual battles for a reason. We go through local battles and also we see global things happening. And he lets all that happen for a reason to show us things. I want you to stay with me here. I believe the last election was a case in point for America. 
I believe COVID-19 was a case in point for us. I believe the Ukraine is a case in point. God lets all them things happen for a reason. Would you agree? So a lot of them things are out of our control. Would you agree? We have, we, we can't, we have no influence whether COVID comes or it doesn't come. We have no influence over the election apart from voting for in an election. But all these things happen to show us personally who we are and where our focus actually is. What is the focus when these things hit us? What is the focus? What are we looking for? What are we ultimately searching for? If you notice with anyone that's focused on the problem, they're full of fear, they're full of doom and gloom, and they're full of unbelief. 100% of them. The other thing is they're totally negative to be around. The other thing is they're insecure and worried. They're always talking about, did you hear this? Did you hear that? Blah, blah, blah. Honestly, I can't be around that for more than 10 seconds until it affects my spirit. How about you? It's just so wrong. And the men of God that I've been through from a child, the men of God, the women of God I've been around that have impacted my life were always people of hope. They were always encouraging you. They were always inspiring you by their testimony, by their talk about Jesus continually. The Lord, do you know what the Lord's doing? Did you know what the Lord did last week to that little girl? Do you know what the Lord did here? Do you know what the Lord did for me? That was their conversation. They would share their story. And before you knew, you were fired up. If, if God can do it for him, God can do it for me. They inspired me. We're not talking about positive thinking here. We're talking about faith. Faith is a very positive thing. Amen? Amen. It brings life. It, it's very contagious. Faith touches one person. Faith touches another. Faith touches another. Before you know it, people around you are fired up. Let's take the enemy head on. Ah, oh, but you don't know what the devil's... Who cares about the devil? He's a loser. He's a liar. He's a defeated foe. Amen? He's under our feet. He's not over our head. I want to say where your focus is will determine your thinking, your mental state, and also your feelings. You're either going to get up in the morning with a skip in your steps saying, He is in control. Lord, what have you got for me today? The devil should be running from you, brother, sister. I can tell you the devil was worried about Jesus. Jesus was not worried one little bit about the devil. And as you look at the church after Pentecost, do you think they were worried about the devil? Oh, we can't go to Thessalonica because the devil's really strong there. I mean, think about it. They were looking out in a heathen world. Every city was nearly 100% heathen. Oh, we can't go to Philippi. I, I heard that the, the heathens there are really passionate. You know, they... They're really strong in, in what they do. Do you think the disciples worried about that? What was their focus? What was their confidence? <coughs> so, do you really have an idea of the signs of the times? Brother, sister, are you getting it? Are you getting, when you look out there, do you see God or all is what you see is the enemy? What do you see? Ah, but look at our government today. Who cares? Look at our God. He's stronger than the government. Hallelujah. Ah, but look at what Putin's doing. Putin is just like a grasshopper compared to our God. If God says, now, nah, Mr. Putin, you're dead. Guess what? Guess what happens right away? He goes to hell right away. And so does all the guys with him. He's going to be with Hitler unless he repents. By the way, and I say this, and you may disagree, but I say this. The Lord could save Putin. Do you think that's possible? God could wonderfully, it's not too late. 
But you say, well, look what he's been doing. I mean, how possibly, how possibly could he ever get into heaven when he has done that to little children? Do you think God could possibly save him or is that impossible? Unless he has been given over to a reprobate mind, there's always hope. So today, believer, I want to encourage you to have an understanding of the times, but not in the typical way that most American Christians think about the days, where they're just, oh, look at this, look at that. I'm talking about biblical understanding of the times. To find God in the midst of where you are. See what he's doing. See what he's saying. See, Lord, what do you want for me? What do you want for me right now? What do you want for the church right now? Yes, be aware of what the enemy's doing, but go with faith and power and let's take this generation for Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Brother, sister, I want to just talk to you first of all. What's your focus? What has been your focus? What is your focus? What is going to be your focus? Between now and seeing Jesus. Because I can tell you what, you can disagree with me all you want and that's fine, but I'm, I'm sharing the word of God. I'm telling you what God's servants were. I'm telling you who Jesus was. I'm telling you that he's still alive. He's still moving. He's still working. All I want to know is where is he and what's he doing and what's he saying? What's he got for me? What's he got for the church? We need to know what the enemy's doing, but I am not going to make that the focus. And this is not going to be the focus of this church. And you have the right, if somebody wants to take you there, say, I'm not going there. I'm not interested in that. I, I, most of us know what way this country is. But that is not the focus. We, the focus of this church is Jesus Christ. If you don't like that, find another church. I'm serious. Find another church that wants to be all about the problem, the problem, the problem. But I'm not going there. That's not who we are. This church is all about the victory, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church is a militant, victorious church taking the kingdom of darkness. Christian, be honest with yourself. Are you getting it? Are you truly getting what it is to be a believer? Where are you spiritually? I can tell you, if you're focused on the problem, you're backslidden. You just admit it. You're backslidden. You need to repent. You need to get back to the Lord. And you need to say, God, forgive me that I have taken my eyes off you. Just like what happened to Peter when he took his eyes off Jesus? What happened to Peter? What happens to you when you take your eyes off Jesus? You are used to no man or beast. You're just, you, you've, nobody's saved around you. Nobody's uplifted. Nobody's inspired. They're just, it's all hopeless. And nobody wants to be around that. Honestly, you, you need to have your head examined if you want to be listening that day upon day upon day upon day. See, a diet of that, that'll kill your spirit. It'll kill you. And I say to everyone here who's on social media, I said, be careful what you spend the percentage of your day focused upon. It is okay to look at the news and to, to see what's happening throughout the world. I'm not talking about that. It, it's, it's good to identify, but that's only a small part of the picture. Identify that and say, then, Lord, what is my part? What is my part to make a difference? Are, on social media, are you, are you presenting people hope, direction? When you go into the workplace, are you, when, you know, Monday morning, people's going to be talking about Ukraine. You know that. But do you then turn the conversation a little bit higher to something heavenly? Do you give them hope or do you just nod the head, yeah, it's not terrible? Where are you, brother? Where are you, sister, spiritually? Are you just going through the motions? Are you playing church? Or are you getting the days that you're living in? Because once you know the times, then you can be part of the answer. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Lord, like the children of Issachar had an understanding of the times, I pray that this church would have an understanding of the times. 
Lord, it's a great day to be alive. We are so blessed to live in this day. And Lord, I thank you for allowing this church to be birthed in this day. I thank you for letting us have a church on this reservation, O oh God. I thank you, Lord, for the light that is shining. I thank you for the lives that have been changed, that are being changed and will be changed. Lord, we give you the glory for every salvation, every restoration of a marriage, every backslider that has come home, every healing, every person that has been saved from a serious accident. Lord, for every family that has been kept together, we give you glory. We can see the workings of your hand in every row in this church. We give you thanks for what you're doing in this day. We thank you for the opportunity that you are, Lord, if you don't come before it, that we're going to have church tonight in Decatur. We thank you for an open door, for being able to meet. Lord, there's people who would dearly love the, the, on a, this Sunday to be able to go to church, but they can't. Maybe their church is obliterated. Maybe if they went to church, they would be arrested and thrown in prison for 15 years. And yet we have the liberty and freedom tonight to go to the house of God. Lord, forgive us for any apathy or just laziness that we would not want to be engaged on the Great Commission. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Lord, we focus on you and we will always focus on you because we know there's no plan B. Lord, help us, inspire us, encourage us. In Jesus' precious name, amen.